Good morning. Galatians 5.13. Now you were called to freedom, sisters, brothers, and siblings. Only let not your freedom be an opportunity for self-centeredness, but through the love become enslaved to one another. For the whole teaching is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Yet if you bite and devour one another, see to it that you are not consumed by one another. I say this, walk in the spirit and do not gratify the flesh. For what the flesh desires is contrary to the spirit and what the spirit desires is contrary to the flesh. For these are op in opposition to each other to prevent you from doing whatever you want. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the power of law. Now the works of the flesh are plain. They are sexual immorality, impurity, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, heretical schisms, envy, drunkenness, carousing, <laughs> and the things like these which you all were warned before. Those who do such things will not inherit the majesty of God. Beloved, will you join me in a prayer of preparation? Holy God, we turn again to these ancient texts, asking for a word just for us translate into something our hearts need, a balm, good medicine, what we need to be up and walking in the spirit. Amen. I want to begin at the end of today's scripture, that laundry list where it says, the works of the flesh are sexual immorality, impurity, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, heretical schisms, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which you were all warned before. Those who do such things will not inherit the majesty of God. This laundry list from Paul, that famous killjoy, breaks my heart a little bit. I mean, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissension, strife, envy, heretical schisms, I can see where these would not make for good long-term living if we want to be a people at peace. But sorcery, I mean, we live in California. I've become part pagan since I moved here. I pray as honestly and truly in the redwoods as I do in this pulpit, and lately I've been known to shout spells at the ocean. I don't know where that's coming from. And then there's sexual immorality and impurity. Who gets to define the terms for those? Because we know how those words and ideas have been weaponized against women, unmarried people, queer people, interracial couples by the white supremacist patriarchy. And finally, the real deal breaker, carousing. What is life without carousing? If you ask me, it's just not worth living. I can't go six months without a good carouse. Why well, I caroused just last night. Paul is always going on and on about the dichotomy of the spirit and the flesh, as if God created one but not the other. So much joy comes to us via our bodies. A perfect strawberry picked and eaten in the sun. The touch of skin to skin. A good jog or swim or sweat, all of which you'll have an opportunity, an opportunity to do in community this Saturday at our first that I'm aware of, uh, First Church Berkeley Triathlon. 
letting those endorphins fill and calm us. You can't tell me that's not from God. Then again, a lot of difficulty and doom come to us via the body. Injury, illness, hunger, cold, heat, the pain of pushing a human into the world and the pain of watching a human we love leave it, leave their flesh behind, abandon us. The demands of the body never stop. It constantly wants to be fed, washed, brushed, put to bed, woken up. It needs different kinds of products for skin, hair, teeth, eyes, digestion. Paul said the spirit and the flesh are at odds with one another. And while he's wrong in his insinuation that one is better than the other, he's dead right that it does often feel like spirit and flesh are in this cosmic tussle even in those moments of health when nothing hurts too much, then there are moments when we seem to transcend our bodies, to maybe forget we even have bodies and touch heaven for a moment. Paul was right about that too. It can come when we're in a good yoga flow or summiting a mountain and finally see the view or lost in making, creating, or the moment between sleep and awakening when we are not us at all, but one with everything. To use Paul's language, those are moments when we inherit the majesty of God. And we can't always live in this pure spirit moment. We're not meant to. To want that is a kind of death, skipping out on fleshiness and all its messiness. But to Paul's point, neither should we settle for the temporary joys of the works of the flesh. A, not, a life of nonstop carousing is a dead end. We might go so much further on the road before us. We were made to keep moving, to walk in the spirit. We were made not to satisfy our body's constant demands for comfort and pleasure and safety and approval, we were in fact made to love, to love our neighbor, to be enslaved to that love, to make sacrifices for that love. There is a salvation in that kind of self-giving, self-emptying, self-denying love. And it is counterintuitively freeing. God recently gave me a chance to practice that kind of love at a whole new level. Back in July when I was on sabbatical, my family went to Cape Cod. My dad lives in Plymouth, Massachusetts, about 45 minutes away. And literally an hour after we arrived, my dad was supposed to join us at the Cape Cottage the next day, I got a text from my sister who was at our dad's house. They had walked the short block down to Plymouth Harbor together, and on the way back, he started to feel strange. She's a nurse and made him go to the hospital, and by the time I got there, he was paralyzed and couldn't speak. He was having a stroke, the first of his otherwise incredibly healthy life. Now, being medically vulnerable was the worst thing imaginable for my super independent dad. He's a Vietnam vet, a former Boston cabbie who had once pushed a thief who was robbing him at gunpoint out of his moving cab. And finally, before settling into his career as a self-employed carpenter. At 78, he had recently climbed up on his own roof to fix it after a storm. Against daughterly advice, I might add. And he handled most of life's storm and that storms in that can-do way. So it wrecked me and my sister to see him on that gurney, unable to speak or move, imprisoned in a body that after nearly 79 years had just stopped without any warning. The only thing he could do was roll his eyes and raise his eyebrows in embarrassed chagrin 
His eyes said it all. Can you believe this is happening to me? My sister and I followed the ambulance from his small regional hospital to the big hospital in Boston an hour away. Waiting back at the house on the Cape were my best friends and their kids, who are my kids' best friends. And the eight of us had not all been together once in, six, in the six years since we moved away. We were supposed to be carousing. And now I was at the hospital in the middle of the night. And to be honest, I felt like a petulant teenager. This stroke was so inconvenient and not at all part of my sabbatical plans. And what my petulance was masking was fear and grief. I wasn't ready for any of this. I wasn't ready for my dad to die or even to have to become his caregiver. I understood at some level that God didn't send this disaster, but God was using it to help us both keep growing up, to keep walking in the spirit out of the cul-de-sacs we'd gotten into. And facing my own, facing my dad's mortality, I would have to face my own. I would have to choose his needs over my fun for an indeterminate amount of time. And my father would have to come to terms with his vulnerability, his absolute fleshy helplessness and dependence on other human beings for everything. I think he thought he'd just be a young middle-aged person for about 50 years and then suddenly die, but often that's not how we age and how we pass. And we were both being given a chance to become true elders in the way that Richard Rohr describes them. Not just people getting older, but people who are in fact still getting wiser. I brought my dad home a couple days later with his new anti-clotting medication. We had a great family reunion at my sister's. He was more himself, more alive, frankly, than he'd been in years since before COVID and my brother's death four and a half years ago. I think we all wanted to believe that his stroke was an anomaly. But a couple of weeks ago, as I was packing the van to take five of our church kids to work camp near the Oregon border, my sister called again. George had had two more strokes and was en route to Boston via helicopter. He had five strokes that week, and he survived all of them with no obvious deficits. A miracle! I flew to him when work camp was over to spend days by his hospital bed and in his house, calling, texting, cooking, cleaning, fluffing, filing, winnowing, figuring out med schedules, buying equipment, PT, VNA, tangling with all the tube styles, alarms, and acronyms that are the lot of an ICU patient. I carried with me this paint chip that I had embossed while at work camp with our kids. The young leaders of Sierra Service Project had led us on a spirit walk through the coastal forest and out onto the beach. And at each prayer station, we added a word to a different color on the chip. The first word described how we felt after a guided meditation in that forest. The second word described something we loved about ourselves. The third word was one we hoped people might use to describe us. All three words were followed by the phrase, I am enough. And my chip reads, Lucid, childlike wonder, wise, I am enough. My dad had to lie flat for many days. The man who taught me about the ministry of silly walks couldn't. Eventually, they let him sit up in a chair. One day, they let him walk with help. And finally, he walked unassisted out of the hospital, out of the delirium that the white walls had inflicted on him, his days and nights topsy-turvy. We went home, where we both began the trying and laborious work of letting our relationship change again. 
I took away the keys to his car on the advice of his neurologist. And that was his cue to act like a teenager. <laughs> Because spiritual growth is not linear. We're never always moving forward. We loop back. We were both learning that love means, to some degree, having your freedoms curtailed. Because we're not just here for ourselves. We don't just live for ourselves. We were created to love one another and serve one another. On my last day at my dad's house, I suggested we walk to the beach. He hadn't done that very short one block walk since his first stroke. My fearless father was afraid, but he got on his feet, refused his cane to my chagrin, and we set out. I recently learned that walking is essentially organized falling. Standing still is not a big deal, but walking requires complexity, trust, a willingness to become destabilized, to disrupt your equilibrium, to keep going and keep growing. My dad was fine on the walk down, but when we got to the shore, he panicked. How stupid of me to come down here without a plan for getting back. I didn't bring a phone. We didn't bring a car. Dad, 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 I can go get the car. I can leave you my phone. I can be back here in five minutes. There's people all around to help. But neither one of us moved. We sat there on the seawall, staring out into the blue. Then finally he rose and took my arm, and we walked each other home. Amen. <laughs>